Well, it's lovely to be here to be able to talk to you today a bit about um, some of the work that we've been doing in the UK for the uh, microbial um, community uh, using OpenStack. So I'm Tom Connor. I'm a senior lecturer at Cardiff University. So I'm a member of the academic faculty there. And, uh, and um, I'm one of the, uh, the, the academics that's involved in this project that I'm going to be telling you a bit about today. Um, so before I get started, I just want to sort of flag up and, and uh, the, the, the people that are involved. So I'm obviously here. I'm, I'm the only person from CLIMB who's, who's traveled out for this, this meeting. But, um, but there's a, a cast of many who have been involved in actually getting the project up and going and, 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 and making the project happen. Um, so I'm, I'm a bioinformatician. Um, so, uh, so I, with, uh, with Nick Lohman, um, uh, sort of designed and, and, and have led the implementation of the system. But we couldn't have done that without um, a significant number of people on the technical side who we've worked very closely with to actually um, uh, bring the project to fruition. So um, just as a bit of an overview, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about microbial bioinformatics and about why we might care about um, developing infrastructure for, for, for microbial work. I'm going to talk a bit about this concept of biological silos. And um, uh, so if you're not a biologist and if you, if you don't know what the field's like, then it will give you a bit of a sense of, of, of where the problems are. I'm going to introduce uh, genome sequencing for those who don't, don't know it, aren't familiar with it. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how we're using the cloud as a, as a solution for some of, our, some of the problems that I'm going to outline. I'm just going to talk then a bit about CLIMB and some of our key features. So first, um, what are bacteria? Um, I'm pitching this just in case there are people in the room who don't really know it. They're tiny organisms. They're microscopic organisms that make up over 50% of the mass of life on Earth. So if you were to take all life on Earth, and you have a set of improbably enormous scales. Um, the bacterial um, mass of, 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 of those cells will considerably outmass everything else combined. So bacteria are, make up the majority of, of, of life on Earth. They're fundamental to life. You find them everywhere in every environment. Um, there are more bacterial cells in your body than there are human cells in your body. We rely on them in, in every possible way. They're enormously adaptable. Um, they're very plastic genomes. They can swap, swap genes in and out. They can share genes between different, bacterial, between different bacterial species. And that means they can adapt very rapidly to changing conditions. And they have genomes that range in size from a few hundred thousand base pairs up to sort of 10 to 12 million base pairs. There's a, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, variability uh, within bacteria. And uh, even within a species, you have a variable genome. So if you took you know, the genomes of everybody in this room, we would all have the same set of genes. We might have different versions of, of each of those genes, but we'd have the same set of genes. Uh, if you were to take the E. coli out of the guts of every person in this room, they wouldn't have the same set of genes. There'd be a few thousand genes in the E. coli genome that would be shared between all of them, but then there'd be a load more, several thousand more genes that would be present in one or two people here, but not everybody. We can examine bacterial genomes by sequencing them by a technology that I'm going to be talking about in a, in, in a moment. Um, and because DNA mutates at a relatively constant rate, we can take multiple bacterial samples, we can take multiple genomes, uh, we can sequence them, and then we can compare them. And because of DNA mutating at this relatively constant rate, uh, at a rate of a molecular clock, we can actually then infer how related they are to one another by the changes that are, are present between samples. And because uh, genes encode proteins, and proteins are the blueprints, um, and, and, uh, sorry, those, those proteins um, actually uh, confer some sort of function, we can look at the proteins that are present that are encoded within a genome and infer something about what the bacteria are actually doing and, and how it might respond to things like, say, antibiotic treatment. In terms of what I do, I work almost exclusively on disease-causing bacteria, on pathogenic bacteria. And so the, the picture on the side here, just to emphasize the scale of, uh, the scale of bacteria, um, it's a pathogen that I work on called Shigella flexneri. And um, in the background is a human embryonic uh, uh, stem cell. And um, the Shigella is invading that stem cell. And that's how the Shigella causes disease. It goes inside, the, the, the in, inside cells that line the gut, causes inflammation, which then causes dysentery. So why care? Um, Diarrhoeal disease in numbers. You might be wondering why and how bacteria relate to the cloud and why actually you might care about ensuring bacterial research is funded. Um, so just a couple of numbers. So 200 million people on, on, on the planet Earth have gastrointestinal disease at any point in time. And if you were to visualize that, um, that, that's about, that they will produce in a day about 60 million liters of diarrhea. Okay? And so that is equivalent to all the water passing over Victoria Falls in one minute. 
right? So if you don't remember anything else from this talk, you will remember the waterfall of diarrhea, right? <laughs> and, and, and so to take that a step further, if you were then to stand next to Victoria Falls and watch it for six hours, you would have seen the volume of diarrhea produced by gastrointestinal disease by the human race in a year, right? So it, 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 it's a lot of diarrhea. And so the funny thing is that in developed countries, we often laugh about things like diarrheal disease. Um, when I was a student, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd maybe go out after a night out, and you'd, you'd be on your way home, and there'd be a, a kebab van situated somewhere nearby, and you'd have the kebab, and you'd come home, and you'd be rather ill the next morning. And that would be an inconvenience, because we're well-fed, we're healthy, we have probably quite a good healthcare system nearby. That 200 million cases a day translates to about 2 billion cases of disease every year worldwide. And the serious bit is that 5% of all deaths in low to middle income countries are due to viral diseases. So this isn't so for, for us in, in, in the West, we, we can be a bit blasé about it, but actually it, it, it's a killer that affects a large number of people. And it's mostly children that are affected, okay? So it's a serious issue. We do have gastrointestinal pathogens that cause tens of thousands of cases of disease in places like the US, in the UK. Um, and that, can cause, that causes many deaths as well. Um, gastrointestinal pathogens are one of the key reservoirs for things like antimicrobial resistance as well. So they're, they're big, big problems. And there are, there are many other pathogens. This is just, a, this is just one example of, of, of why we should care about bacteria. So I mentioned before, uh, bacterial genomes can be sequenced. And the way that's, that's worked over the last few years is um, in the bad old days, we had this thing called an ABI Sanger sequencer. And so when the Human Genome Project was started in the, in, in the late 1980s, uh, this was the instrument that was used to sequence the human genome. And to do one single human genome, it took about 15 years using these old instruments. In the mid-2000s, we had a, a set of new sequencing technologies come on tap, uh, the Roche 454, the Selex Illumina, and then we've got a new, new generation uh, approaches like Iron Torrent, PacBio, and Nanopore. And what that's done is that's changed the scale of what we can do. So on, a, on an ABI sequence, you do about 96 bits of DNA up to about 1,000 base pairs. And you would run that over a few days. And you get those 96 bits back together and try and tie them back together to make a, a contig or set of contigs. With a modern Illumina instrument, that's now up to 500 million reads per run. So you can see the increase there. And, and select Illumina instruments aren't that expensive. Most universities have at least one. Um, and so since the mid-2000s, we've seen an explosion in the size and scale of the sort of questions we can answer. And fundamentally, um, what's happened is we've had a decrease in the cost of sequencing. So in 2003, to sequence a human genome cost $2.7 billion, right? So that's $2.7 billion visualized there with bales of, of dollars on forklift pallets. In 2016, we can do that for $1,000. Okay, so we've gone from an amount of money to sequence a human genome um, that you could only carry about in a shipping container to one that if you're better off than I am, you could carry about in your wallet, right? And obviously for me, humans are relatively boring. Um, for the same money, we can sequence around about 50 bacterial genomes. So sequencing is cheap, um, it's relatively rapid, and um, we can do all sorts of fun things with it. So biological silos. So this is a lab. This is a, a picture from the Welcome Images of a, of a laboratory. And when you're a PI, when you're a researcher in a university, especially in biology, um, the lab is everything. So you, you, you come into university as a newly minted uh, academic, and you are given a lab space. And into that lab space, you buy equipment. So you buy things like a PCR machine. Uh, you might buy um, a, a equipment for flash chromatography. You might buy a fancy microscope. And that sits in a physical space that is yours and has your name on it. Each group is led by a PI. So there's a single person who's in charge of each group. And your name is on that door. You, you know, your name is on the risk assessments. Your name is, you, you are the line manager for the people who work within that group. So the group members, my group members, work for me as the PI. Each group will generate its own grant income. Okay, so when I put in a grant application to a grant awarding body, I'm generating income for the university, but that income comes effectively to me because it comes onto a budget line that only I can spend. Each group has its own physical space, has its own equipment, 
and it's recognized and understood by the university. So universities understand groups as these sort of organizational units. And what that means is that, to my mind, an academic group is more like an SME. Now, we're part of this large, you know, multi-hundred million pound organization. But actually, day to day, our functioning is much more like an SME. You know, my concerns as a PI are where's my next grant coming from? You know, how am I going to keep the people who are working for me employed? How am I going to generate my research outputs? Um, so it's much more, I guess, like, like, like an SME rather than being part of a larger organization. And this view translates into bioinformatics. Um, that's not my machine room, but um, it could be. Um, all of my work is underpinned by computational resources. So we generate vast quantities of sequence data, and then we have to do something with it. And that requires um, quite hefty amounts of computational capacity. Um, when I arrived at Cardiff, so I came from a place called the Sanger Institute just outside Cambridge. So Sanger sequenced one third of the human genome project, um, uh, the human genome during the human genome project. The, when I left, um, uh, they had around about 16,000 cores for a total staff of about 900 people. Um, it was freely open to all. You had huge amounts of storage. It was basically limitless compute. Uh, I arrived at Cardiff, and basically what we had was a, a server in a cupboard right, from my department of 120 academics. Um, so I suddenly had to work out, well, how was I going to do my computation intensive research in this new place? Uh, I had years' worth of scripts and software that I'd written on the Sanger system, which were now incompatible with my new environment. And I was completely on my own, because I was the only bioinformatician in a department which didn't really understand bioinformatics. So I did what most academics do, which is I built my own system. And that's not at all unusual. Um, quite often, when we, when we put in grants, we'll put in money for a server or for some compute. And because of the way that the, the, the budgeting works, that budget line is then mine. And so instead of handing my money off to a central university IT resource, I buy up my own server with it. And this isn't an unusual story. So um, last autumn, Nick Lohman, uh, one of the collaborators on Climb, and I did a, a Twitter survey uh, where we asked bioinformaticians on Twitter uh, where they did the majority of their, their work. And um, I guess the interesting thing for OpenStack people is the fact that uh, over half of their work was done either on a local resource, i.e. a server in a cupboard, um, or on a personal computer. Um, and the cloud is almost completely unutilized. Okay, so that, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, I think, and, and that's something that, that maybe we could delve into. But, but, but fundamentally, at the moment, the cloud isn't used. And actually, the ways that, that bioinformatics is done is done in a way that's not really reproducible and not easily shareable. So we come to this problem. Uh, the saying I call it the sequencing iceberg, but it's really a big data iceberg, which is that we can now generate data very cheaply and very rapidly. But our main costs as researchers are actually in the bit that most PIs don't see, which is the informatics expertise, the reproducibility of our software, and how easily we can share our data, um, the compute capacity and the storage capacity that we need for that. Um, and, and that's all underpinned then by, 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 by this expertise as well. So you come to OpenStack. Um, when we sat down to plan climb about two years ago, um, we thought that, that actually there was a better way of doing things, and that was to provide bioinformatics infrastructure on demand. Okay, so providing um, systems that the researchers could use for doing their, their research, um, pre-installed with software and with packages that they, they want to be able to use, providing an environment where people could share images, share pipelines, and share data, um, all on the same infrastructure. And so we thought OpenStack was quite a good, um, quite a good system for that. Um, knowing the way that, that, that academics work, um, the uh, uh, OpenStack enables us to add hardware pretty simply and, and cost effectively because we can, we can buy capacity in larger chunks. Um, and critically for us, it means we can meet multiple use cases in a single system. So if I'm a, a postdoc who's got a small number of bacterial genomes to analyze, I probably need quite a small virtual machine with you know, not huge amounts of RAM, so sort of talking maybe 64 gig of RAM and, and eight cores. Um, whereas if I've got a large metagenomics data set, I'm going to need terabytes worth of RAM and hundreds of cores. So the, the, there's, there's a wide range of use cases within microbiology. Removes the need for closet IT systems. So the idea of having these horrible servers in closets. Actually, with, with OpenStack, we can provide somebody with a nice siloed 
virtual server that's theirs has got their lab's group name on it. And it actually removes the need them, for, them, for them to actually have to, to, to manage their own server and have their own server locally. And, and for me, the nice thing is it really simplifies this process of installing and maintaining software. If we want to share software, if we want to share pipelines or have a, a sort of core set of analysis packages that we use, um, doing it via a, a, a cloud system is much, much simpler than, 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 than having to do it, you know, having to reinstall a system every time we want to, want to really change something. Um, and the, 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 the other major advantage for us was that um, at the moment, you have a situation in biology where data is very frequently shared, but very infrequently reused. And it's the same with software as well. So you go to most publications that mention the bioinformatics approach, and you'll find a link to GitHub. And you'll follow the link to GitHub, and then you'll find there's a load of dependencies in there which aren't really specified, there's no documentation, and you can spend a week trying to install this software and still not get it to work. And that, that, that's a huge problem for software reuse, because if you've got a paper that has a set of data which you can't get access to, and a set of software that you can't install, then by definition you can't reproduce that. So we think um, having a single environment that brings together storage and compute um, through a relatively simple interface is actually a real way to get over this reproducibility issue. It also simplifies training. So the, the thing that a lot of people in IT don't understand is that biologists are extremely poorly skilled in IT and have no interest and no desire to learn. So if I've got a postdoc in the lab who spends 99% of their time sitting at a bench, petting things and doing stuff like PCR, sequencing, whatever, in a laboratory, that 1% of the time where they need to sit down and actually analyze the data, they're not gonna remember the training course they did on how to access the command line 18 months ago because they're not using it every day. The skill fade is just too great. And so we expend in, in bioinformatics a lot of time and effort trying to train people up, missing the fundamental truth that actually a lot of biologists don't have the time to refresh their training every time they need to use a system because they do it so infrequently. And so the, the, the advantage that we have here is, first of all, that we can simplify the training because one of the classic problems with training is that if I go off to the Sanger to do a bit of training in one of their great advanced courses, when I come back to Cardiff and I find that we've got a completely different system installed or they won't let me install the operating system that they used at Sanger or whatever, um, I suddenly can't translate that training as easily. Whereas within a single environment, we can really simplify that. Um, and it still, but it still doesn't get past this, this local problem. Um, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a critical issue. So, the other thing that sort of really underpinned CLIMB that we really started with was the fact that uh, as microbiologists, we often represent a much smaller portion of much larger departments who are concerned with things like human genetics or human genomics. So like we, we, uh, in the School of Biosciences, I think there are about five microbiologists of 120 academics. And so quite often when you get a system being built for an institute or for a department, what will happen is that the microbiology needs will be an afterthought and will be a small portion of this overall whole. Um, and that's a problem no matter where you are. So there's a big issue for microbiologists that quite often we don't get a, a fair slice of the pie um, on a national level simply because stuff's done locally. Um, and so no, no local group is, is likely to be a sufficient size in terms of income or, or importance to be able to qualify for having a single system of their own. But there are a lot of microbiologists across the UK. So there are, there are thousands of us uh, spread across most universities. Um, and they all need these resources to do, their, to, do their, to do their work. So the idea behind CLIMB was to create a one-stop shop for UK microbi microbial bioinformatics. So the idea being it's, it's a system which is uh, what I call a public-private cloud. So it's public in the sense that if you're a UK academic or part of UK government, you can use it for free. It's private in the sense that if you're not in one of those groups, you can't really. Um, we've already got a set of standardized cloud images to implement key pipelines, so providing a simplified set of pre-configured images that people can just go on, spin up, and use is really, really, really great for breaking through this training issue and through the siloization issue. And that's all underpinned by a storage repository, which gives us a way of, of allowing people to share images that they've created, Im images that they've produced, but also sharing data within the system as well. Um, so what, what I guess the vision that we've got ultimately is an edgy room for microbial genomics, a place where you, know, you don't have to worry about where it is you're actually signing into, but you can get access to your data no matter where you are. And additionally to that, we're providing access into other databases from within the system. So um, one of the problems if you're uh, if you've used it with things like the European Nucleotide Archive are, the ENA is great for storing data, 
but actually accessing hundreds or thousands of bacterial samples uh, to put into your analysis is very, very difficult when you're downloading it via FTP. And so we're going to be mirroring some of these databases locally, the entire database, uh, and then presenting that out through clients. So people can very simply um, move data in and out. And again, that's a, another thing that we're going to be doing using OpenStack. So the system itself, four sites, four universities. Each university has a system. Uh, connected over Janet, so we're very lucky in the UK to have this uh, academic network which is uh, uh, extremely fast and so enables us to move large amounts of data relatively easily. Um, different sizes available, uh, sort of, but these are, are different to the sort of stand open stack Im images in the sense that actually they've got a lot more memory than you would uh, normally get. We're able to support over a thousand virtual machines simultaneously and that's actually limited by uh, the number of external IP addresses we can get from the universities rather than any hardware constraint, and we're not doing oversubscription on this. We have about seven to eight petabytes of object storage across four sites, and so that gives us two to three petabytes uh, when using erasure coding and, uh, and replication. We also have four to 500 T of, of local high performance storage, that's GPFS uh, per site, and that's for scratch space and for mirroring databases and for providing a um, uh, place to spin up VMs as well initially. And our vision is to have a single system with a common login that uses uh, federated credentials to enable anybody with a .ac.uk email address to be able to log into our system. Uh, and the, I guess the special source in terms of what we're doing is a between site data replication means that if we lose one of our sites, then you can still access your files no matter where you are. And I've heard a few people saying that that's unlikely. Um, most of the universities that, that, that are within the group have had issues uh, in the past few years with data center being down for an extended period of time, whether it's for, uh, we had a big uh, maintenance, uh, three weeks of maintenance just before Christmas, um, uh, the year before last, uh, Cardiff when the whole data center was shut down to replace the power systems there. And so the, these things do happen and actually by having four sites we get the resilience of, of being able to um, just spin up an instance somewhere else. Uh, we designed the system to add extra nodes in universities um, so we can uh, have uh, other universities join us within, within CLIMB and, and share their, their data and capacity as well. And the critical thing for us is that it's academic led, uh, it's focused on the community because we're all part of the community and we're quite well connected within that community. And um, we couldn't have done it without the collaboration that we've had from our local HPC teams. System itself, so we're running OpenStack Kilo at the moment. Um, we've procured the hardware in a three-stage process. Um, the procurement itself was pretty difficult because we had a very short time scale. So between all the contracts being agreed between the universities, uh, we had six months to, buy all the, to do the tender, buy all the hardware, get it installed and have acceptance testing completed. Um, and that's made even harder because by definition we're designing a system for a set of unknown use cases. So we don't know what people are necessarily going to want to use it for and what's going to be the most popular thing which makes it difficult. Um, and you know, even thinking about things like acceptance testing, how do you design acceptance testing for a cloud system when you only know about HPC? And that was a, that was a particular challenge for us. So the way it fell out, uh, IBM OCF, uh, so one of the integrators in the UK, provided the compute, and then we have Dell and Red Hat providing the storage. And uh, all our networking is provided by Brocade, uh, with the exception of our Mellanox InfiniBand network. Um, and um, we didn't know the vendor, but from pretty early on, it was clear that OpenStack was going to do what we wanted it to do, and, and so we were, we were pretty sure that it was going to be an OpenStack route that we were going to be taking. So per site, we have two uh, router firewalls, um, uh, commodity x86 hardware running um, uh, Viata software, and they're capable apparently of routing about 80 gigabit each. Um, three OpenStack controllers, uh, 2164 core, uh, 512 gigabyte RAM nodes, and then we have these three extremely fat nodes, three terabyte RAM nodes, which allow us to do some uh, analyses that simply wouldn't be possible um, using our current infrastructures. And we have around about 500 terabytes of GPFS on each local site. And GPFS runs over InfiniBand, and then we have that failover onto the 10 gig if there's an InfiniBand issue. And then we also have um, per site around about two petabytes of Ceph, uh, and that's 27 64 terabyte RAM nodes, and those are the Dell um, 730XDs and that just runs across the, the 10 gig backbone. So we have a pretty standard network topology. Um, we use both InfiniBand and Ethernet, um, and that's uh, for a couple of reasons. So um, 
we're co-located with the HPC systems on each site, and most of those HPC systems run on InfiniBand. So if we wanted to move over to being able to provide capacity for, for the HPC systems, maybe using Ironic, um, we'd really need IB to do that. Um, and the other thing is that, that, that the, um, the guys at, at, at Warwick and at Birmingham who are experts on GPFS told us that, that InfiniBand was better, so we made sure that we got it. Um, OpenStack, however, just, just pretty much runs over the, the 10 gig. Uh, we have a Brocade VDX fabric, um, and the fabric is pretty good. Uh, we've had various promises from vendors over the last few years, a lot of which haven't really panned out, um, but the, the fabric is actually very, very good. Uh, the VDXs work very nicely, and it does pretty much what it says on the tin. Um, unfortunately, the Viatas, which are also extremely expensive, uh, weren't so good. Uh, we have various excuses for why that is. Um, I'm told by a sysadmin in Birmingham that, uh, that the newer version of Viata is actually um, working as expected, but that's taken 18 months from the point of purchasing it for it to be uh, usable for us, which is a bit annoying. Um, using Neutron throughout, uh, we had some problems initially, but actually the stability over the last sort of six to nine months has been much better. Um, we have found that our network problems have been the hardest bit to fix. So um, most, of the, most of the other issues that we've had have been relatively minor, but it's the network issues which have caused problems throughout. Um, Many of these are reported on the bug tracking sites, but the issue that we find quite often is when you've got a, a non-specific network bug, actually tracking down um, a bug report for that, that particular issue, for the particular version of OpenStack that you're using is actually non-trivial. Um, so we, we, spend, we spent quite a lot of time actually um, uh, hunting down uh, bugs and solutions uh, uh, on the internet for, for some of these things. So our compute, um, the key thing for us was knowing our workload. So um, we have some extremely large, complex data sets. Um, so when we're looking at bacterial populations, say from a fecal sample, where you have 10 to 10 bacterial cells per gram and you have um, thousands of bacterial species, if you sequence that and you get you know, hundreds of gigabytes worth of data out the other end, the complexity in there is such that actually you need a lot of RAM to be able to process that in a reasonable way. And uh, actually this, on, on the side here, I've got a, um, a screenshot of a, um, at the top of a, a thing called MetaRay um, uh, running, running an assembly. I think it's uh, using 1.8T of RAM quite happily, and that's one of the, the 3T RAM machines there. So we need to be able to scale up to, to large RAM single-core jobs. Bioinformaticians are generally not very good at writing software. Um, we write software pretty badly as a rule, and so often the software is pretty inefficient, but if it's the only tool you've got to do the analysis that you need to do, and you're in competition with groups all over the world to publish your data first, you use the tool that's available, for you, available now, and you don't try and spend six months re-implementing it. We're currently set up using regions, uh, which is a source of some pain. Um, when we uh, started, and actually it's still the case, um, the sales documentation was a little confusing because uh, if you go to documentation, it says don't use it in production. Then um, your usually conservative university system admins who know what it's like to have an academic shouting at you say, we're going to do regions and not cells. Um, so our issue um, when we started was that it looked like regions were the way to go for multiple sites. And actually, um, I think it would have been better if we'd gone with cells. Um, we will be moving to cells in the next 12 months. So that's why it's interesting to be here and hear about some of the discussions about um, cells version two. Um, but we still have a, a number of issues with the compute as well. So we've had um, some performance hits on the large memory machines because of uh, NUMA related issues. And um, in Cardiff, we, uh, we have a slightly different network set up. So we're all copper cabling in Cardiff. Um, so we use 10 gig base T. And um, uh, IBM supplied Broadcom cards uh, with that, and those have been caused no end of problems because as soon as, well, we had an issue on the controllers where as soon as we put the controllers under any sort of load, um, they would the, the cards would just fall over straight away. You get kernel panic, and the controllers would reboot. And so, the the failover worked brilliantly, right? So that the, the controller the controller would, the first controller would go down, and it would fail over to the next one, and then that would go under heavy load, and then that would crash, and it would go over to the next one, and then that would go under heavy load, and that would crash as well. And then we'd have all three controllers failed, and the MySQL database not coming back up, so we'd lose the system. Um, we did that quite a few times before we finally worked out where the problem was. It's fixed now, but it, it, it's a concern, uh, and it, it's something that we, we think might be causing issues elsewhere on the system as well. So uh, our storage has two, two elements. Uh, we have local scratch, so that's our GPFS, and then we have a replicated object and block storage. Um, the split 
actually made our acceptance testing easier because we could buy the GPFS with our compute and then have a place to spin up VMs straight away, um, all putting by the same integrator, so we could get past acceptance testing. And then we spent a bit longer actually getting Ceph properly configured to, to run with our system. Um, it also fits with our future needs. So um, uh, what we would like is to have a reasonable amount of local scratch space for storing all sorts of um, uh, uh, large files that we might not want to pull down over the internet. And so GPFS is actually really great for that as soon as Manila's working uh, properly. Um, and then um, the Ceph is replicating between sites and, that, that, and that's actually taking over our block storage. So at the moment, Cardiff is still running with GPFS where it spins up the instances, um, but both Birmingham and Warwick are using Ceph entirely for, for block and object storage now. So we're gradually moving that over ahead of our, our formal launch. Um, we've had issues with hardware here as well. So we had issues um, uh, with some of the Dell hardware. Um, initially, it was set up, and there were issues around the RAID cards and, and how the RAID cards interacted with Ceph. Um, and then we've also had some issues with GPFS and the IBM hardware. So in addition to the Broadcom issues, we've had um, uh, been having a few issues with our InfiniBand set up at the moment. Uh, and we've also had a, 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 we also had initially a problem because we picked the wrong block size with GPFS. So when we set GPFS up in Birmingham, we picked a block size that was way too large. And so when somebody was on the system and started generating huge numbers of small files, uh, the performance tanked. And, um, and so we had to re rebuild the system. So CLIMB is more than just a system. Uh, it's a key component of our research infrastructure. And what we've done is we're, we're coupling together not just our compute and our storage, but we're also coupling sequencing onto that and the training component as well. And it's actually OpenStack that really makes that possible because um, that's bringing together the compute and the storage and that gives us the flexibility then to, to work around it. Um, and it also gives us uh, phenomenal flexibility for our, our quite varied workloads. And uh, I think critically, um, we're eating our own dog food. So um, uh, Nick and I have both moved our research um, onto the CLIMB system. So that's where we do all of our, our computational research now. Um, and, uh, and, and it works for us. And, and we've got, then got a vested interest in making sure that the, the service remains uh, effective. Um, when we're talking about coupling our sequences and object storage, um, it simplifies the analysis pipeline for our users. So this is a screenshot from a, um, a sequencing service that's run out of Birmingham called Microbes NG. So with this service, people send in bacteria and then the Microbes NG team will sequence them. And then when the data comes off the sequencer, it's picked up, pushed straight into Ceph, um, following a small bit of pre-processing. And then it's available as an object in Ceph to be imported directly into CLIMB. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a complete pipeline with a single environment where somebody can, can go from sending in some DNA to actually having some quite useful results already pre-processed or running on top of OpenStack. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we, we're, we're um, shamelessly um, stealing, borrowing, um, working together with the, uh, um, the, the um, uh, uh, VLSCI in Melbourne uh, to move their genomics virtual laboratory over onto CLIMB. So the issue that you don't get past with, with OpenStack as it stands is the fact that Horizon is a pretty horrible interface to give a biologist and say, you go and create yourself a virtual machine. Um, and so uh, the, the, the guys in Melbourne have overcome that using this system called the GVL. And the GVL is pretty simple. You have a form where you paste in your uh, EC2 credentials. Um, and then you hit launch. And then that interacts with OpenStack, spins up an instance, and gives you a website. Okay, and if you, want, if you want to go and have a look at it, uh, the IP address on there, the website's still up and running. Um, and then you can go to that website, and, and, and what you've got is you've got a personal research gateway. So it's running things like Galaxy. It's running Cloudman, which gives you a scalable cluster on the cloud. Uh, it's got an Ubuntu desktop. It's got an uh, IPython notepad. It's got Juniper Hub on there. It's got uh, RStudio. And it's got an SSH into a system that's pre-installed with a load of pipelines. So what this does is, in a single step, provides for about 95% of the biological users that might conceivably use Climb. Um, and it's a great example of of what OpenStack can do, um, that actually we, we, we can have this system running here interacting with the APIs. The user never has to see anything complex, and it's a simple case of you centering your credentials and it spins it up for you. And the nice thing is that the Nectar runs on OpenStack as well, so transitioning this over from, from Nectar onto Climb um, took, a, took a couple of days, and that was it. So that's pretty good. 
So we have a set of continuing challenges. Um, we've got federated access issues, uh, trying to get that, trying to get our federated access working with, with Shibboleth. Um, we have VM scheduling issues as the uh, Birmingham cloud is now 100% utilization. We start to run into issues when people try and schedule instances and you get uh, either um, uh, VMs not being scheduled onto nodes that look available or you get issues where um, you get nonsensical error messages that nobody can understand. Um, we had some issues with storage configuration. Our block size was wrong and we've had some issues with large volumes as well that we're currently working through. Um, uh, our networking is, is now mostly um, uh, uh, not to do with OpenStack, it's actually to do with our, our Viatas. Our Viatas. Um, and, uh, and we're starting to see now that, that the system is starting to get hammered, we're starting to see some issues coming up as our, as our systems go under heavy load. Um, this is compounded slightly by the complexity of OpenStack and Ceph, but now we've got about 18 months of, of operation experience fixing our system when it breaks. We're actually starting to feel a bit more confident and the system's a bit more stable. Um, I think it also helps with the improvements that have happened uh, in, in, in Kilo as well. Um, and then finally, our, our, our last challenge is, is this user experience of Horizon, which is a real issue even for quite seasoned bioinformaticians who, who actually come to it and are really very confused by the whole interface and don't really want to use it. Um, and that, that's, that's compounded by, by a lack of use of error information. So our performance is generally very good. Um, this is just a bit of benchmarking that we did on the system. Um, so 10 bioinformatics workloads. Um, in the middle, we have, um, we have the... Uh, um, uh, university, the Cardiff University Raven, which is our HPC system, and so that's one. If it's above one, it's faster. It's, if it's below one, it's slower. And um, properly configured, um, we see very little difference in terms of our um, uh, images, uh, our, client, our, our VMs, compared to the bare metal performance. There's actually one exception, which is an interesting one. Um, and, um, and, and so, all in all, we're actually quite pleased with the overall performance of our system. Um, the, uh, I mentioned the, the block size issue, um, and so this, uh, this benchmark down here is actually climb running with the block si wrong block size, and you see that some workloads aren't really affected, but in others there are real dropouts in terms of performance, um, and so that sort of really brought home to us how critical it was to get the, get the block size right. So where are we now? Uh, we've got um, computational hardware in place. We've got uh, over 100 users already. Um, we've got two modes of access, um, and we've got access for registered users to, our, um, to the Horizon interface, and uh, we're adding our launch system, which is the GBL access uh, in, in the summer this year. And just in terms of sort of outputs that we're generating, um, so this is a, this is a Nature paper, um, uh, which was uh, led by Nick Lohman, um, and um, what they did was, uh, was Josh Quick, uh, the first author on the paper, went out um, to Africa, uh, with these uh, nanopore sequences, so about the size of a chocolate bar, um, and um, they sequenced the Ebola in real time. Okay, and and the way that that works is that you 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 um, you get the Ebola samples, you crack open the DNA, you run it through a nanopore sequencer, and then you upload it to a cloud system because there's no compute available locally. You analyze the data and you can start inferring things in real time about transmission and about the spread of the the, the epidemic. And so that's, I guess, an extreme example of where this sort of technology can be really useful. If you've got a core infrastructure that provides the capacity for analyzing sequence data in real time, um, then it means you can go to any part of the world, whether it be um, Africa for Ebola or Brazil for Zika, um, and you can take uh, an ongoing outbreak and actually track it in real time using sequencing. So we've got a pretty complex system with a lot of challenges, but we've got a, a very clear vision that underpins that. We, we know what the community want, um, we know what we're trying to give them, and, uh, and, and actually that's, 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 that's probably the most important thing. Um, we've got various complexities around the fact we're not a single site, we're actually built across four universities and with the capacity to expand to more. Um, and actually the, the key to everything that we've done has been our collaboration between our technical team and, our, um, and, and, the, the, uh, and the academic team. Um, with the, the vision for the project. Um, we think we have uh, huge potential um, from providing resources like in the case of Ebola for actually um, respond, uh, responding to outbreaks, um, as well as sort of long-term supporting of research groups, so spinning up um, long-term instances that run for an entire group, so you replace that, that server in a cupboard with a, with a VM running on the cloud um, that, that they could be reasonably sure is gonna be stable and is gonna be, gonna be there uh, tomorrow. Um, 
We think this is pretty much only possible using OpenStack at the moment. Um, the, the, the complexity is the price you pay, I guess, for having a broad range of features that you can configure to do what you want. And, uh, and I think looking forward in terms of the OpenStack side, our challenge is actually to engage better with others in the community. So a lot of the stuff that we've been doing has been very siloed, I guess. Um, we've been working in amongst ourselves and with a few people in the UK. And actually, one of the reasons why I wanted to be here in Austin was so that I could connect up with some of the people um, on the developer side who maybe might be interested in what we're doing and, and might have some solutions or um, some interesting ideas for some of the problems that we face. Um, I think some of our use cases will push OpenStack, um, and I think maybe we'll have some useful feedback for the developers as a result of that. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll leave you with the acknowledgments. Questions? You mentioned VM scheduling issues. Could you elaborate on that? I didn't quite understand. Uh, so we, we, we had a few issues where um, we, set the, we set the schedule up with the filters that we think should be in place, and then um, the system comes to schedule a VM, and it gives, Horizon gives us an error saying it can't find available space even when there are nodes with huge amounts of space available on them. So, so do you believe it's a configuration error or a software error? Um, we're not sure. We think it's probably a configuration error, but the, um, the scheduling documentation is not the easiest for us to work through to work out exactly where that might be. Um, it's, it's working out exactly where the, where the issue is that's proving to be a problem at the moment. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> can you mention um, what manpower in terms of FTEs are being used, and does this include HPC guys? So we have um, four full-time sysadmins now employed. So the most of the system has been set up with two FTEs of sysadmin, and then a lot of time from myself and Nick um, to actually get the system going, and, and Simon in Birmingham. Um, so I guess in, in terms of the sort of the main contributions, I mean, Simon in Birmingham, uh, Marius um, uh, have, have really been sort of central to getting the system up and running into the state that it's in now. Um, and, but going forward, we just recruited another two sysadmins to provide user support as well as further, further support to the system. It helps that, that Marius um, is extremely experienced with Ceph, so he's taken over the setting up of Ceph. And the way that we did the, the, the procurement was such that Birmingham had a framework agreement for buying HPC systems. Um, so we actually procured the Birmingham part of the system first, which gave us six months for Simon to set up OpenStack, test it, and get to a configuration that we were happy with for when the, the main kit went in. So it, it's probably been about, I guess, two to three FTEs over the last 18 months. Question about your Ceph um, uh, spanning sites. So are separate Ceph installations, or is it just one that has replicas in all four sites? So it's four separate, four separate Ceph installs, um, which replicates between sites via the gateways. Okay, so you have Redwood Gateway replication. Yeah, we do. Okay, and uh, you mentioned disaster recovery scenario where one site is down. You basically have the data uh, in S3 available at the other site, but not the cinder volumes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you mentioned the um, alternative dashboard used by bioinformaticians. They put their credentials and they spin off yep. VMs. Uh, that works in a single tenant scenario where everybody has just one network and they all basically have their VMs in the same network. Yeah, so the, the, um, so the, the, the GVL works with, you, it just takes your user credentials and you, you need certain settings. So, the, um, so you, have to have a, uh, you have to have an external IP network and you have to have an internal network on there. And as long as you've got that as your tenant, it will spin up an instance. Okay, so you can specify network. additional networking uh, yeah. details. Yeah, but, that, that's, but that's through the configuration on the, on the actual, um, uh, on the launcher itself. Okay. And are you using any Docker containers to package your applications to make it easier than having uh, glance images as a share? So what we have is we, so it's actually all done by Ansible. So we have a, um, so the GBL is a, there's a core um, image and then um, you build the file system on top of that using Ansible. So it, it's, just, it's just an Ansible playbook, effectively. Yes, but Ansible is going to install, basically, with... You might still run into dependencies issues and... You know, but as I say, it starts off with there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a GVL base image, which is quite small. 
mm -hmm. and then and, and that that's got everything that's required on it. And then there's an Ansible playbook which is kicked off. And uh, install the, the software every time. Yeah. Okay, because we are actually using Docker containers on top of VMs. Okay. And this basically allows to have no dependencies on the OS of the. Yeah, the, the, the GVL is a special case because the launcher only runs the GVL. So we, there aren't any other images on there yet. So there are different versions of the GVL that you can run through, but that, that's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, a single, it's a single launcher for a single result, effectively. Okay. Okay. How do you find the performance of um, the Cinder volumes? Are you using the Erasure coding for, for the Cinder no. pool? No, we're not using Erasure coding for it. standard replication. With uh, SSDs for journals, or yeah, okay. yeah, and it's fine until it flashes. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Okay, thank All you. All right. Thank you very much.